Our panel this afternoon is uh, Intervention in the Dilemmas of Security in Afghanistan. Uh, and it is a part of the Afghanistan theme semester at the International Institute, co-sponsored by virtually everybody at the International Institute, the International Comparative Studies, the Center for South Asian Studies, of which I'm director, Juan Cole, uh, the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, the Center for Russian and Eastern European Studies, uh, and the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. That last one is kind of hopeful thinking. Um, and uh, we're uh, uh, honored and uh, privileged to have with us uh, three uh, experts in Afghanistan uh, who are um, not only uh, scholars uh, of the uh, region and um, uh, doing very serious academic work on the subject, but also uh, go out uh, to the country and so have seen with their own eyes uh, what's going on there. Uh, so uh, this is scholarship plus field report. And um, uh, so we're going to go in this order. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Patrick uh, Kelly uh, will be first, and then uh, Gilles Doronso of the Carnegie Endowment, and then Amin Tarzi, uh, Director of the Middle East Studies at the Marine Corps University. Uh, so let us begin uh, with uh, um, uh, Patrick Kelly. Uh, who we're very pleased to welcome back to the uh, Ann Arbor campus. Uh, he has a master's uh, in uh, South Asian studies. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, great pride to us uh, to have him back. Uh, and um, he uh, has been a South Asia foreign area officer uh, in the US military. Uh, he's worked in and around the Indian uh, subcontinent for a decade, uh, in, uh, including two combat tours in Afghanistan. Uh, and he's uh, dealt with, in his postings, a large number of operational problems, including intelligence planning, uh, security cooperation, and political military engagement. Uh, he's currently uh, at the headquarters U.S. Central Command. Uh, and uh, has also served at the U.S. Embassy in Nepal uh, and uh, has been uh, at the headquarters of Regional Command South at Kandahar uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a long and already very impressive uh, CV uh, and we're eager to hear uh, what Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, Kelly has to tell us. Thank you very much and thanks for having me here. At the outset, I just want to note that I am not a representative of CENTCOM, and my views do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Defense. As we go into the presentation, you may see why I've made that very clear up front. I am participating at the very kind invitation of the university, and it's very nice to be back. Um, I have very fond memories of my time here, and individually as an officer, I believe strongly that uh, every time we have a military-civilian engagement opportunity, and particularly a military with academic community, uh, that's an opportunity that serves both communities well, and I'm very happy to participate. Now, I'm not an expert in South Asia. I've worked on it for a long time, and all I've gained really is Socratic knowledge. I know how much I just don't know. And particularly in a, in a group like this, I wouldn't contend to any kind of particular expertise. What I can provide, however, is a little bit of uh, an inside practitioner's perspective on how things are going and what kind of things we're up to. Um, I think a lot of it to the outside seems you know, baffling, frustrating, even maddening. Now, with what I tell you, it's still going to be baffling, frustrating, and maddening, because it is. But you'll get to see a little bit more of how it looks to us from the inside. Um, as the introduction mentioned, you know, I've done some time here doing academic work. I went to the Indian Defense Services Staff College, uh, worked as an intelligence officer in Kabul. And in my last job, which I'll talk a little bit more in this presentation, I did uh, border coordination at Regional Command South, which meant dealing with not only coalition forces, Afghan forces, Pakistani interlocutors, and the civilian interagency, which is a big part of what I want to talk about today. As a military officer, I'll apologize up front for any acronyms that tend to slip out. I tried hard to avoid this in preparing my remarks, uh, but I think if I start to get going on something, you will not be surprised to hear me say some unit was OPCON to ODRP and then TACON to IJC in support of CIVSOC Alpha. So if I do that, please do forgive me. And I will note that it happens the other way as well. Um, as a sometime academic, I will occasionally let out the occasional epistemological or apophenia when I'm briefing a general officer. And in an organization that requires ninth grade comprehension in all reading products, that is a serious faux pas. 
Um, also, as a, as a nod to the audience, I tried to avoid going for PowerPoint dominance and information overload. Uh, at one point, I did think about having no slides whatsoever, uh, but I afraid that would undercut my credibility because no real military officer would ever give a briefing without PowerPoints. <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, the first PowerPoint, I wanted to subtitle my presentation here on why is a raven like a rating desk? Now, I'm sure probably a lot of you recognize that line from the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, which invites one kind of reading of what I'm going to talk about. Um, but one, the reason I specifically chose it is it's essentially it's the unanswerable riddle. And I think that applies to a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. And as for that topic, I wanted to point out that the way I read this when I look at the question that was posed to us, um, without initiating a, a debate about nomenclature, uh, intervention is a choice by a third party to enter into a relationship, an issue, a space in which they would not normally be a party to. Uh, for example, to me, that wouldn't necessarily apply to our relationship with Al-Qaeda. Um, Al-Qaeda very forcefully invited us into a direct relationship with them. Uh, we had choices of how to respond, but we didn't have much choice to avoid the relationship. But once in that relationship, we have a lot of choices about interventions and other relationships we can engage in. It's kind of like being married. Once you're married to your spouse, that's a primary relationship. We have a choice now. Am I going to intervene in other relationships? Is her cousin's reading problem my problem now? Is my nephew's, uncle's, cousin's, brother's drinking problem my wife's? So that's what we've now entered into a broader spectrum of uh, interventions and choices that we have to make. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the 2001 AUMF. I can use the acronym because it's spelled out on the slide. I highlight it here because this is the fundamental legal document that authorizes all the things we're up to in Afghanistan. I've artificially inserted this blue line distinguishing to me that primary relationship above the line and the optional relationships below the line, the choices that start to appear once we've gone into Afghanistan and started to conduct these kinds of operations. The next slide I'm going to show is we're in this so-called global war on terror or overseas contingency operation or global war on extremists. I'm not sure what it is these days. But who are we fighting? There is a list of terrorists. It's quite a long list. This is the State Department Foreign Terrorist Organization list. Now, I invite you to look at that list and then particularly note who's not on the list, highlighted in the box in the lower left. It's our three principal antagonists in Afghanistan are not on this list. Now, there are, there's a number of different lists, I'll admit that, and different agencies have different flavors and there's different levels of classifications. But the fundamental point of distinction I'm trying to make here is generally sound. So with that in mind, what is it we're actually intervening in? Is it just a geographic space? Are we intervening in an Afghan civil war that's been going on before we got there and will continue after we leave? Are we really just intervening in the India-Pakistan competition in which Afghanistan is simply a sidebar for their contest? We're monkeying around in there for a while and then we'll leave and it will continue. I'm particularly interested in what other things that we are looking at is from the, the United States government because we're not just intervening out there. Our choices about what we've done in Afghanistan have impacts about what happens to us, who we are, how we're organized, how we do business. And I think that's something to think about over time. Now, at the outset, when we start to talk about culture and what we intervene in culture and the culture reflections on us, um, I will admit that we have a certain image problem within the military, and we're not quite the knuckle-draggers we might be imagined to be, but I will admit that there's probably more Copenhagen and dip cups in a tactical operations center than there would be in a faculty lounge. Now, in Amia Culpo, I'll offer my personal favorite example about this, though it comes from Iraq. A friend of mine was briefing a general officer on his plan for the reconstruction of Mesopotamia. General officer, bit on his cigar. Son, what's this Mesopotamia business? My friend said, well, sir, Mesopotamia is the historical name for this area. And the general threw the report down and said, take this back and do your research. Everybody knows this is Asia Minor. So my friends went back, changed it to, this is Iraq, turned it back in, and it came back with a note from the general saying, well done. And by the way, you were right. This is Macedonia. So he has ever since been known as General Macedonia. Now, that said, things are getting a little better. One of the unintended consequences of a long-term conflict like this is you have a small group of people that continue to go back again and again and again. Uh, you hear much in the press about you know, less than 1% of America is shouldering the burden of the war. Now, that's a topic for a separate discussion. But in point of fact, the number is even smaller than that. Because all due respect to my comrades in the Air Force and the Navy, very few of them have Afghan dust on their, on their boots. And even within the military, it's a fairly small number of Army and Marine Corps units and people that go back again and again and again. A side effect of that is you'll have someone like a General Nicholson, who was the Brigade Commander in Regional Command East, then he was the Director of Operations in Regional Command South, then he was the Director of the pac af Coordination Cell at the Joint Staff, and now he's back as the Deputy Director of Operations for U.S. Forces Afghanistan. And that kind of relationship filters down, and at my level at this point, just about any af pac kind of coordination event or planning event, I'm going to know half the guys there. We went to school together, we borrowed each other's cars, we've known each other for a long time. 
And part of that might just be an impact of growing old. That's going to happen. But I prefer not to think about it that way, but more that there's a developing coterie of people who really know what's going on. And so you occasionally still see a general officer say something like, well, why can't we just get the Afghans and the Pakistanis to use one map with a common border demarcation? Which I think is covered in Afghanistan 101 magazine, but it's gotten a lot better than it used to be. So with this mind of our mixed cultural insights, we find ourselves faced with choices over how and when to intervene in situations we don't really understand, and we can't really discriminate what it is that we're choosing between. One of the ones I want to talk about in particular is Abdul Razik, who's someone I had some personal experience with. Technically, Razik is, the, is an Afghan border police commander at Spin Boldak with a couple of hundred guys under his command. And this is along the main road. Um, you see Spin Boldak highlighted there. It's the, the main supply line between Kandahar and Quetta. He also happens to be a key leader amongst the Atukzai, who have a traditional rival with the Nurzai in the area, and as a consequence of that, has several thousand men under his informal command. However, aside from these kind of accepted facts, it's widely accepted that he is significantly involved in hashish smuggling. He also is involved in a significant corruption that's going on at the border. Now, what that kind of corruption looks like, uh, these pictures don't help you too much, but I'm looking here. This is the gate at the actual crossing where stuff goes across. One of the more significant things that goes on is, for example, auto smuggling. When you bring a car that you want to sell in Islamabad into Karachi, you have a significant tariff to pay. But if that car is only being transited through, Afghanistan, through Pakistan into Afghanistan, the fees are significantly less. Conversely, when you bring something from Afghanistan into Pakistan, the tariffs are less. So it makes a lot of money for someone to move stuff from Karachi up to Spin Boldak, park it, then send it back across so it's being exported into Pakistan from Afghanistan. Guys like Abdul Razik make a lot of money off this, and there's cuts that go all the way up the chain of command to Kabul of people who are profiting from this. Um, it's quite striking when you fly into Spin Boldak, you'll see it looks like Moss Eisley. It's a big desert, sprawling town, little adobe huts, an old uh, 19th century British fort along the ridgeline, and then a huge, sparkling collection of uh, brand new cars, brilliant colors in the middle of the desert. So we as the military look at this guy and go, well, what do we do? Um, his, his area is stable, it's secure, he's anti-Taliban. Now he's also horribly, horribly corrupt. Is this in our, in our interest to take him out because we're interested in justice? Or are we more interested in leaving him in place because he assures stability and security? And I'll just point out, not only is this just any border crossing, uh, over 70% of um, our supply lines for the war run through two places. One is at Spin Boldak and one is at Torkham Gate. So if the security situation down there you know, degrades significantly, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So ultimately, what did we do? We threatened a lot. Uh, we wrung our hands. Uh, at one point, we planned to go down there with handcuffs, and then we backed off. Uh, what we did find is that uh, Razik's boss, Hakim Mullah, is actually a little bit corrupt, but not so corrupt that he actually had powerful friends. So we went and arrested him instead. So I think that's one way to look at the kind of things that go on. An interesting side note there is how we intervene in geography, the, the, the point about creating a common border space. Um, it was interesting to find out that our National Geospatial uh, Intelligence Agency went back and got the British maps where they actually drew the Duran line with pencil and used that to map the geocoordinates that actually our pilots use when they're looking at the borders. Um, recognizing our, our problems with trying to understand what's going on and having cultural knowledge uh, leads to another dilemma, chiefly our engagement with you. As we reach out to the academic community, we want some more insight. We have the kind of knowledge, we want the kind of knowledge that you have, but that obviously creates some dilemmas for you as well. Um, I know that uh, Michael Bhatti, some of you may have known, um, was killed in Coast. I spoke to him just before he left when he was debating about whether or not he should go um, support this kind of thing. Um, and, and I take it very personally that I recommended strongly to him that he go just before he did. And even beyond you know, risk to your person, you know, what does this mean for your community? When you support us, at what point does uh, field research become intelligence collection? At what point does data analysis become intelligence? Um, and that's something that you guys have to carry as a burden uh, going forward. Above and beyond that, how much is it really worth? There are mixed results from the human training teams, largely because of difficulties in us dialoguing across our communities. I highlighted this just to, I, I, one of the things I really enjoyed here was uh, encountering Borgia's uh, Chinese encyclopedia in his terms of animals, which tried to give you a different way to look at the world. And as Foucault says, I think it's in the beginning of order of things the possibility of imagining that, to be able to see the world in a different way. And if what if we in one of our intelligence centers could come up with a similar taxonomy of terrorists would be uh, something quite striking. Another point I wanted to bring up when you're talking about interventions in knowledge space and how we look at problems and how we think about problems. Uh, this next slide, some of you may have seen, it in fact is true, this slide was produced to support um, the International Security Assistance Forces in 
Afghanistan. Uh, fortunately, this one went just a little bit overboard and was summarily dismissed. But it's a good example of what PowerPoint thinking is like, and that's the kind of thinking that frames the military and how we approach problems. As a contrast to that, how do we look at, how do we get inside the ideas and the kind of knowledge space that's circulating we're seeking to intervene in? You know, I come from this world where we're thinking like this. These are the kinds of things we think about. As an alternative, one of the side projects we have in my office, because I live in a very small uh, windowless cell with no clocks, fluorescent lights, and sometimes not enough oxygen, we went through a lot of local press reporting, and we pick up interesting things that come up. Now, all these items are actual true. For those of you who might be able to read it, the first one is tiger cats, the Pichot Palang. To hunt the ferocious tiger cat in the Somali plains north of Kabul, you must move through a maze of walled dirt alleys and dip into the icy fear that chills entire villages. This cat is dropped out of helicopters by U.S. forces to terrorize local villagers. Now, the interviewer who reported this story asked one of the respondents, well, wouldn't that kill them? And he explained, no, they just fly the helicopters very low so the tigers can jump out. We also saw reporting about uh, monkeys being trained by the Taliban to attack U.S. forces. And in contradistinction, there are uh, counterterrorism monkeys in India. These things are real. I've seen these. And a report by monkey annoyance efforts that squirrels, flying squirrels, are the best way to terrify monkeys. Now, I bring this up. I mean, it's, it's, they're silly examples. But it's real press, and it's a real way of thinking. And how do we approach that? Do we, do we just ignore it? Is it relevant? Do we try and engage with it? Which approach is going to be, have the biggest risk of Orientalist uh, malformation of what we're engaging with? And aside from the silly thing like this, that kind of thinking is reflected in much of Pakistan, where there's a lot of media that covers you know, the, the attacks in Peshawar are really the Taliban being sponsored and supported by Mossad, the research and analysis wing, and the CIA. Now, I personally am not too aware of the jihadi, American, Hindu, Jewish nexus. But in Pakistani thinking, it's a powerful thing. So how do we engage that worldview, to me, as a challenge? Now, this leads me to uh, another thing that I want to think about is um, metrics and the language we use to describe what's happening. And I think there'll be a little bit more about this later. Metrics are something that it depends on how you look at the information. I've highlighted here the kind of the, the old style of, is it two faces or is it a vase? It's Alice walking through the looking glass. We spend an awful lot of time collecting information in Afghanistan and Pakistan and then trying to make meaning of it. Unfortunately, not only is the intelligence, the information collection a problem, it's the meaning making that's a problem. One of my pet peeves is something that's very much like this. Now, I've used notional numbers just to make the point. In the first one, you'll see violence is increasing. Well, we'll assess that and go, well, that means we're winning because we're moving into the terrorist safe havens. We're taking the fight to the enemy. This is a good sign. Now, if violence were decreasing, we'd probably also say that's a sign that we're winning because people are more protected and safe. Now, I'm not disputing that either is necessarily false, but if one metric can only tell you that you're winning, it's not particularly useful. Uh, we in the military are very can-do folks, and we like to say that you know, failure is not an option. But let's be honest, failure is an option. And you need indicators to let you know if it's approaching so that you can avoid it. So this is another problem I think that we need to address. Uh, speaking of language and some of the crazy things that we come up with, one of the problems that I'm concerned about is the language that we're using. This is not a fully resourced counterinsurgency campaign. This is not nation building. Well, not fully resourced counterinsurgency or not nation building isn't actually anything. So what is it that we're doing? I've seen principals committees and deputies committees spend literally hours, and this is golden time of senior leaders, arguing over what does operational dismantlement mean. Those kind of language things seem a little esoteric and academic, but they're extraordinarily important to what happens down in the field. It specifically goes to the issue we're going to talk about later of is tactical success the same thing as strategic success? And what stories do we tell uh, to distinguish between the two? I want to talk very quickly about the theater of war versus the performance art of war and these language games and these images that we're playing. Um, a perfect example is at uh, Kandahar Airfield. Um, we play at war there. In the morale and wealth recreation tent, you will see junior soldiers playing Call of Duty on their Xboxes. When you go to the, the Kandahar Airfield boardwalk, you will see officers playing Civilization IV on their laptops. And at the very end, the, the middle part you see in the uphand left, they actually have a society for creative anachronism where they do sword fights and things at Kandahar Airfield. So I find this extraordinary of what does it mean for the, the theater space that we're engaged in. Very quickly about the interagency. I elected not to put a caption on this, but I think it reflects to me what the interagency is. How do we in DOD interact with other government agencies, and what does this mean for the future? Um, there's a lot of militarization of things that have gone on. There's a lot of movements in how funding and authorities are displayed and articulated and interrelate with one another. 
and okay, Afghanistan is one particular example, but after 10 years, these things are becoming institutionalized. The distinctions between Title 10 money, which is actual operation money, and Title 22, which is security assistance money, and the traditional roles that DOD and the Department of State have in those two activities are changing. And I think more care needs to be taken at looking at those and what happens in the future as we come out of this war one day. And the last point I wanted to make was about time. There are interventions and aspects of time that influence this. Uh, there's an, uh, an old saying about telling time in two meridians is a principal imperial challenge. Uh, but we're telling time in, in half a dozen meridians. And not only is there the widely wanted, you know, Kabul time versus Washington time, there's Afghan time versus coalition time, military time versus civilian time, there's even Michigan time. How do we resolve those and what do they do to what we're up to? How do we coordinate, for example, one briefing that I go to here, the commander's update brief, will be happening at all those different times. All those different players are at different points in their days, different perspectives, you know, different chemical levels. Um, it's truly a global enterprise, and that's interesting for me. Finally, we are writing a chapter of history, but in which book? And this comes back to what I was talking about earlier, the, the theater, the story that we're telling, the narrative. Is this you know, a broken and medieval Afghanistan that we're hauling into the light of modernity? Are we really just another cycle of Afghanistan has had good times before, and we're just bringing it back to those good times? Or is this, as often cited, another chapter in the graveyard of empire cycle? And I think finally, the, it's a little chestnut here on the bottom that ISF also watches, but Taliban has all the time. Uh, but I'm particularly fond of that because I think there's some uh, certitude to it. And with that, I think I'm up with my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, view uh, from someone inside uh, the military uh, of uh, the situation in Afghanistan. Our next speaker is uh, Gilles uh, Doronsoro, a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment, uh, an expert on Afghanistan, Turkey, and South Asia. Uh, his research focuses on security and political development in Afghanistan, particularly the role of the International Security Assistance Force the necessary steps for a viable government in Kabul and the conditions necessary for withdrawal scenarios. Uh, he has been professor of political science at the Sorbonne uh, and the Institute of Political Studies uh, of Rennes. Uh, and he is the co-founder and editor of South Asian multi uh, multidisciplinary academic journal of, 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 of that journal and of uh, Europe, the European Journal of Turkish Studies. Uh, he's the author of a big book, uh, a Revolution Unending, Afghanistan 1979 to the Present, uh, a French predecessor to that, uh, and an editor uh, of uh, uh, La Turquie Contestée, Régime Sécuritaire et Mobilisation Sociale, uh, uh, Turkey Contested uh, Security Regime and Social Mobilization. Uh, without further ado, uh, Gilles. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for this nice introduction, even if I am really not uh, an expert on South Asia, generally speaking. <laughs> well, um, I would like to, to, to start with a problem that we have right now, is um, the conflicting two, two narratives we have on Afghanistan right now. Uh, uh, General Petraeus is going to give a testimony uh, in the Senate next week, I think, and he's going to say, we already know what he's going to say, he's going to say that things are going better in Afghanistan, that it's uh, fragile but there are real progress, and that uh, there's going to be more uh, fights next summer because, of course, uh, when, you're entering the, sorry, when you're entering the Taliban uh, sanctuary, so to speak, uh, the Taliban will defend themselves, so they will, will have more casualties. Yeah. And as you, you pointed <laughs> out just a, a few minutes ago, it's kind of potentially contradictory. Epistemologically speaking, it's a, it's a problem if we think about Karl Popper and all these people. It's a kind of, uh, of no proof of nothing. So uh, you have these two, uh, uh, you have this, this other uh, narrative is that Afghanistan is going wrong, that things are going wrong, the strategy is not working. And the key to understand why you have two narratives is that people are not speaking about the same thing. And uh, what's clear it's, uh, is that it's a problem of scale. Uh, which scale are you choosing in Afghanistan? Do you speak about a district? 
Do you speak about a province? Do you speak about a larger region, for example, the east, so-called the east? Or do you speak about Afghanistan as a whole? Yeah. And I'm using my hands a lot, it's a cultural thing, so the, the mics are a little bit too close. Uh, and when you understand that, uh, you face a real problem, which is uh, our local, what I would call tactical successes, building a larger success, or our local successes, just local successes. And it's a general problem that you not only find recently with the US Army and this uh, strategy that was decided a few years ago. It's a problem that NGOs had in the 80s in Afghanistan, that everybody working in this kind of situation have. Uh, what's the relationship between the local and, and the national? So my thesis here tonight is to say that first, what we are doing locally is probably not a success, but that's not even the question. Uh, the point is that even if it's a success, it doesn't translate into some kind of national change. It doesn't serve a larger strategy. Ah. And so uh, the idea is that at the best it's going to work where there are some resources invested, but it's not going to change the momentum. And on the contrary, even on the contrary, it's actually destroying the Afghan partner. We made a choice in Afghanistan, and we made a choice a few years ago now, it's 2008-2009, to fight the Taliban and not to reinforce the Afghan partner. And this is, I will try to show you how precisely it's, uh, the, the choice is made at the tactical level without thinking, without people necessarily thinking about it. But it's the, the, the unintended consequences of the tactical uh, processes. And then, uh, if you don't have an Afghan partner, of course, the whole transition process, the whole, the whole withdrawal, is becoming uh, uh, extremely difficult even, I think, uh, clearly impossible in the next few years. So we'll start with uh, 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 one point that I think is central, is that what we are doing is not what we are saying we are doing. Uh, for example, there is a, a shift, a major shift, since the arrival of General Petraeus, uh, compared to Mac Crystal, who, who uh, what a bad idea to give an interview to Rolling Stone, but that's another story. Uh, there is a major shift. But officially, we have the same strategy. Officially, it's still counterinsurgency. Officially, it's still population-centered. Uh, but when you're looking at what's going on, really, on the ground, we shifted to a strategy that is mostly body count. Uh, and you find that again and again and again. Even if Petrarus wrote, uh, is a PhD about the limitation of the body count as a, as a good indicator in a, in a counterinsurgency fight. But even if you wrote that when, a few years ago, practically all the information you have when people are, are telling you things are going better means we are killing more Taliban. Yeah. The second thing is that, and then, of course, special ops are becoming the key. Uh, remember that in Iraq, according to certain sources, uh, probably around uh, 50,000 uh, insurgents were killed by special ops between the, the U.S. And the, and the Brits. So it's, it's, it's potentially used a huge, uh, uh, a very powerful instrument. In Afghanistan, it seemed that a few thousand, I don't trust totally, to be honest, the, the coalition's number, but 100, probably 1,000 of commanders we don't know exactly what is a commander, but commanders uh, have been killed the last uh, 18 months. Yeah. So this is what we are doing. Uh, the second thing is we are no, no more really population-centered. We are fighting in places. We've never been, actually, but we are fighting in places who are sparsely populated, uh, very far from the city center. Uh, of course, Elmand is the key classical example, Musakala Sangin, or uh, now in Razni province, or in other places. So it's all about territory and not population. And it's a key difference because it's impacting the way you can fight. Yeah. 
And I would say that this has consequences on the way we are trying to deal with the Afghan population, the way we are dealing with the Afghan government, and the overall impact. So the first thing is we are not building an Afghan partner the way we are fighting. I'm here speaking mostly about the South, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I think, true for the whole Afghanistan. Why? First, we invested resources in places where, where there was no Afghan government. There was no Afghan structure. So you're starting from zero, basically, uh, in the places like Marja, which is well known now, in all the Bilman province, in Kandahar. You don't have real, uh, uh, real Afghan administration. You have networks of people. You were speaking about Spinboldak, but it's true for, for the, 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 all these places. At a district level, uh, there is no real uh, civil servants. Uh, it's not working. And the idea was to have a government in a box. Ah, the idea was that you, 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 you bring the, 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 the Afghan civil servant from outside. Ah. And of course, it's not working because people do not want to come. When they want to come, most of the time, they are not local at all. I mean, they even don't speak Pashtun in uh, Pashto in some, uh, in some instances. And uh, they have difficulties to connect. Ah. So we are in a situation where, basically, in the area that, in the areas that have been cleared, it's mostly the Marines, let's say the US Army, is doing all the, all the work, all the real work. Uh, it's extremely difficult to build something that could be uh, constructed as an Afghan partner, an Afghan state, something that is Afghan and we can transition to in a, in a few years. Uh, the second element is that we are using a lot of uh, militia. More and more we are using militia. So we are arming people, and in Afghanistan, uh, it's already a one-way one process. Huh? You can arm people, but you cannot disarm people. Really. That's uh, for obvious reasons. By the way, all the, it's just, uh, all the, all the uh, disarmament process you've seen in 2003, 4, 5 was a big joke, because actually people were, getting, were giving their old weapons so they can get money and buy uh, uh, better weapons. Uh, it has been well documented in all the north, from the Panjshir to mazar -e sharif and it's, it's, a clear, uh, it's absolutely clear. And what we are seeing now with the so-called uh, reintegration uh, of the Taliban, and you have hundreds of Taliban who have been reintegrated. Problem is, first, we don't know if they are real Taliban. And uh, we can seriously think that a large part of them are not real Taliban, just want the money. And the, the, the financial side is totally opaque. We don't know where, you, where is the money, how much, who is in control. So it's a huge, huge element of corruption. Yeah. But that's, that was right marginal. So we are actually using militia directly to control an area, Spinbolak. But in the case of Spinbolak, because you mentioned it, I, I was thinking of it. Even militia from Spinboldak were used uh, in other areas uh, by the US Army to clear an area, uh, in the case of Argandab. Uh, uh, Germans in the north are, are building militia also. Why? Because they don't fight, really. They have a lot of caveats, plus they, they don't know for, uh, clearly how to fight. Uh, and they don't want casualties, so it's a lot of <laughs> things that makes <laughs> fight difficult. Huh? Uh, when you don't know how to do it, when you have a lot of caveats and you don't want casualties, basically you cannot do much than protect yourself. That's what's happening in the north. The Germans are mostly protecting themselves. They don't go out, really. Huh? And so uh, they are using Misha because it's a way to fight the Taliban. Of course, uh, uh, you have to build militia, so you have to give arms. And the people who are taking the arms, of course, are not necessarily very nice people. Uh, yesterday, the, the chief police of Kunduz province has been killed uh, by, uh, by Taliban, so suicide, uh, suicide bomber. And uh, probably too, he was not very liked by, uh, by at least half of the population, because there was also an ethnic uh, problem. But he was not liked by a lot of people in, uh, in Kunduz. So we are putting people in charge without much control, in fact. 
except in a few places. And it's creating, uh, uh, of course, a lot of tensions. What's the impact? At all? And plus, we, are, we have PRTs, provincial reconstruction team, uh, which are, in fact, a kind of Afghan state where it's difficult to work. And they are supposed to coordinate NGOs. NGOs, most of the time, do not like the PRTs because they don't want too much to be confused with the army. And in practice, the PRTs are the guys who have the, they, they have the real resources. They have the competence. They are honest. So it makes a big difference locally. But at the same time, it makes it, it makes impossible for the Afghan state to create its own space. So for all this reason, what we are doing on the ground doesn't produce more uh, Afghan institution. No. So what's the perception of the population? No. The perception of the population is, uh, I would say, the interpretation of events of uh, casualties, civilian casualties, is very much Afghan. Uh, by that, I would like to say that most of people think that the Afghans do not, uh, do not have Afghans do not have information about the outside world. It's it's not true. Uh, they 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 have uh, they have radio at the least. Uh, they have TV more and more, uh, cell phone and so on and so on. So they are very well connected. Plus, do not forget that I would say what 40 percent of the the Afghan population uh, have been in exile in uh, the last 30 years. So it's people basically we are, we lived in one two foreign countries. We are speaking average what uh, I would say two three languages. So they are not at all local in this way. And plus they are moving all the time. Uh, Afghans are moving a lot. Uh, so they are not local in this sense. But the way they interpret facts is sometimes very surprising. Uh, so how do they interpret? Uh, the way we are fighting, what we are doing. First, they are convinced that it's all a big plot, uh, that what we are doing, actually, we are supporting the Taliban. Uh, they are con most of the Afghan population is convinced that we have some kind of deal with the Taliban. That second, we want to stay to, to steal the Afghan uh, wealth, uh, especially minerals and copper and so on. And then, uh, basically, they think it's a kind of colonialism or something like that. And whatever you can say, it's not going to work. Plus, they are convinced that the Brits are, are really bad. But that's, well, that's history. Uh, so they have this kind of way to interpret things, and it's extremely difficult to contradict them, because it's all theory, you know. The second point is that, objectively, they see that we are doing a lot of things the Soviets were, uh, did before. First, we say a lot of things that were said by the Soviets. Uh, actually, for us, there is a big divide between communism and capitalism. But from an Afghan perspective, the things are more complex. The things would be much more modernism, progressivism, something like that, versus more traditional Islam-oriented. And here, when we are speaking about uh, human rights for women, we are basically not very different from the Soviet. Uh, the people we are working with, uh, the state, I mean the state, the central uh, Kabul, the, these people very often worked for the Soviet. Uh, and, uh, or their, 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 their parents now, because there is a new generation. It's interesting to see how we rely a lot on the same social groups that the Soviets were relying on uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so when you see that underground, most of the time, we are obliged for for tactical reasons, to, to have the same outpost to put out but the same place the Soviet did uh, 30 years ago, it's creating this kind of, uh, of interpretation as, well, they are occupying us the way the Soviet did. Uh, and there is a, it's not always true, but the more we are fighting somewhere, the more, of course, this kind of perception is dominant. And I would say the last thing is they see us as fundamentally segregated, uh, different. They are, we are segregating the Afghans much more. Uh, it's very true in Kabul, for example, when you have this, for, I mean, this international society very distinct from the Afghan one, uh, except the people who are the, the, the go-between. And we do not have a lot of contact with the Afghan population globally. Uh, so of course, 
the more we are fighting, the more we have uh, civilian casualties, we, 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 we create this kind of perception. Yeah. So now the, 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 last, the last thing to see is the impact on the Taliban. Yeah. Is this strategy working? Uh, to which extent? First, we don't know really because we are just entering the spring, uh, the spring so the Taliban are back. Yeah. Uh, very concretely. When people are telling you that the security is better around Kandahar, really we don't know because the Taliban to move need the trees, uh, the, the leaf on the trees, uh, uh, for, for protection from the, from the drones and the, the aerial uh, surveillance. Uh. If you don't have uh, leaves, you cannot fight really in this area. Uh, it's very dangerous. So now we are going to see if the Taliban are back. Uh. What we know is that the Taliban central command, so to speak, is in Pakistan. So we can kill all the middle, mid-level commanders we want. Still, uh, the, 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 the central, uh, uh, the center of the organization is in Pakistan. And of course, the Pakistanis are still supporting the Taliban, as everybody knows. So we cannot destroy really the organization. The second thing is that most probably, we did not change the narrative in Afghanistan. Uh, personally, I'm very skeptical about the idea that the Taliban think they are going to lose. And on the contrary, what I am, what I am learning from Afghanistan is that the Taliban have a good moral and they think they are going to win. Uh, so on the, the, this point, it's, it's debatable, of course. But uh, uh, I don't think there is a big shift. Uh, so. Now, I would like to, to try to answer the, the, the initial question with these elements of, uh, that, uh, that I gave. How do we go from a few potential tactical success in a few districts yeah, to a general change in the, the, the balance of, uh, of power and the momentum in Afghanistan? By deciding to make the surge in the south, we decided to fight the Taliban in a place where there was no Afghan state. The consequence of that is that we cannot transfer the security to the Afghan in the south. It's impossible, concretely. I don't know anybody thinking that it's possible in the next three years to transfer the, the security to the Afghan National Army in Elman and Kandahar. That's not thinkable. What's the consequence of that? The consequence is that you cannot, you cannot move U.S. troops to another, to another part of Afghanistan. Because after all, that's the initial idea. Uh, you clear the south, then you go to the east, you do the same thing in the east, then the north, and at the end, uh, the, we basically, we've cleared the, the country, or most of the country. Uh, this is not doable because you cannot move the troops. And it is even more true because we are beginning the withdrawal. 2011, it's more or less the... The, the, the height of the, the, the Western presence in Afghanistan. 2012, you're going to see the Europeans living seriously. And 2013, at the end of 2013, I would say most of the Europeans we, we, we have, uh, are out of Afghanistan. Uh, it's very clear. So you're in this situation where you, you're not going to have more troops to invest. You cannot move your troops, your troops from the south. So it's creating a gap. Uh, and it would be very, very, very optimistic to think that the, uh, uh, that the uh, Afghan National Army, of course, can, uh, can uh, fill this gap. Uh, I don't think it's, it's credible right now. Why? Because actually what we are seeing is more pressure of the Taliban in the east and in the north. Uh, it has been the constant trend the last few years. And this is, what does it mean? It means that politically it's going to be extremely difficult for the Karzai regime, for the, the, the Afghan regime, to survive if you have Taliban uh, 10 or 20 kilometers from Kabul. And that what is going to happen, most probably? Why? Because the United States actually is not defending the Afghan-Pakistani border. You have seen recently that the Pej Valley was evacuated. It's a clear signal that, yeah, it's a clear signal that actually all the border is open. No, it was more or less open, but it's going to be a little worse. And that now the Taliban don't have a lot of, uh, uh, are not very far from the capital. 
And so you are going to have this huge push. The north is disintegrating slowly. I don't think that the Taliban are going to take the city whatsoever, but it's disintegrating, so it's difficult for the Afghan National Army to have a real positive impact. Yeah. Plus, so far, there is no Afghan uh, unit able to, to fight uh, independently from the, uh, from, the, from the coalition. So I would say what we are seeing now is this disconnect between a few tactical success and the general picture. So you can show, the, of course, the scale of what you want to say. There is a success in the district, yes, but doesn't produce anything nationally. Uh, and uh, if the Pakistanis do not change their point of view, uh, means if they continue to support the Taliban, I don't see how the overall picture could change in the next uh, two or three years. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Doran Sorov, for that uh, tour de force. Um, critique of the current policy. Uh, our final speaker this afternoon is Amin Tarzi. He's Director of Middle East Studies uh, at the Marine Corps University in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, he um, uh, supports the MCU by providing resident sc uh, scholars with expertise uh, uh, in the Middle East and uh, South and uh, Central Asia. Uh, as well as representing the Marine Corps at various academic and professional forums. Uh, Dr. Uh, Terzi uh, earned his uh, PhD and MA degrees from the Department of Middle East Studies at New York University. Uh, and uh, his latest works uh, are uh, The Taliban and the Crisis in Afghanistan, a co-edited volume uh, with Professor uh, Robert Cruz of St Stanford University, in which I have an article. Uh, and the Iranian puzzle piece, uh, Understanding Iran in the Global Context. Uh, uh, that's the uh, MCU Press of 2009. So, uh, 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 Professor Tarzi. Thank you. Now you know why I'm here. Uh, jokes aside, I want to first and foremost say thank you for the organizers. Uh, and good to be here. And secondly, I want to say what the Lieutenant Colonel said. I am here on my own behalf, and I'm not representing the United States government nor the United States Marine Corps. Uh, if I did that, I would be saying very little to you. Uh, what I think I have been set up very well uh, with the previous speakers. The first one spoke more about our own internal issues and understanding, uh, whereas the second speaker talked about strategy and tactics inside Afghanistan, but two points. One, he said that the Taliban sanctuaries are in Pakistan, and secondly, he talked about the withdrawal. Uh, we have our own plans, at least on partial withdrawal, but in Europe, it is more an issue of uh, a political issue, and it's happening in some major countries. Uh, I'll name for you countries that are right now talking very seriously about uh, large withdrawals. Uh, Germany will be one. Poland, uh, Canada, not in Europe, but in our neighborhood, uh, well, actually your neighborhood even closer than Virginia, and, and uh, also Denmark. Uh, Denmark is a small state, but it, can, it punches way above uh, the waist in Afghanistan. They are in the fight uh, big time. Okay, what I will talk about is the, the regional approach. Uh, my title is kind of provocative. It says six plus two revisit it. But let's even forget about the title. Uh, in the United States, uh, our president, President Obama, signaled a return to a regional approach as part of this main policy. Uh, for those of you who may not remember that, I will even take a few minutes of my time and read a paragraph from the speech that was given in March of 2009. It says, and finally, together with the United Nations, we'll forge a new contact group for Afghanistan and Pakistan that brings together all who should have a stake in the security of the region, our NATO allies and other partners, but also Central Asian states, the Gulf nations, and Iran, Russia, India, and China. None of these nations benefit from a base for al-Qaeda terrorist in a region that descends into chaos all have a stake in the promise of lasting peace and security and development." End of quote. 
what I will posit here for you is a lot of those, not our NATO allies definitely, but a lot of those other countries named actually do benefit, if not from a presence of Al-Qaeda, but from a region which is either chaotic or at least simmering. Most of them may not want a region that is boiling, but definitely some of them would want a region that is simmering. And I'll try to, at least in, in the time allotted to me, I'll try to explain to you why this is happening. What we have from that day until today are two things. One is something else, a new nomenclature in, the, in Washington, which is called AFPAC. AFPAC stands for Afghanistan-Pakistan Hands, or Afghanistan-Pakistan Contact Group. And, and that basically tries to look at both Afghanistan and Pakistan in one issue. Neither the Afghans nor the Pakistanis and nor the Indians are happy about this whole issue. Uh, but that is one issue. The second one is a contact group. Uh, those of you who have not been into it, and I know none of you have been, uh, it's not nothing happening. It's actually a trip that people go and not much action happens. Yes, they meet, but there's nothing else beyond that. Why? Partially, and I make these statements, one is that most of these countries that we named, neighbors of Afghanistan plus the United States, Russian Federation, and I'm not going to talk here today about others, but there are other countries involved, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, to name two of them, are in Afghanistan for motives other than Afghanistan. All of these countries are involved in Afghanistan for motives that are not Afghan-centric. This is not only today. This happens to have been the case even in post-Soviet invasion. And if Q&A, we can discuss that. I'm a Cold Warrior. I, I have been in the, involved in this thing since 1981 in one way or the other. So, uh, and, and I'm a New York Yankees fan too. Yogi Berra said, Doja Vu all over again. Sometimes I look at this thing and I say, oh, I'm seeing the same thing just happening. Then and now, a lot of these countries are involved in Afghanistan because of issues outside. That's one, which makes the strategy, as, as we heard before from the speaker before me, the strategy sometimes doesn't even sound good and makes the Afghans think, you know what, there's something going on. There's a conspiracy, because when it doesn't make sense to them, they say, okay, there's something else going on. The second issue is, and this goes back to the issue of withdrawal, I traveled to that region with the exception of Iran and China, pretty much the rest of them. All the regional players are already calibrating their policies on post-ISAF withdrawal. That is a very important aspect that we have to look at, all of them, without an exception. Although they may work with us, they may sit with us, with ourselves and the NATO allies. And when I say us here, I mean all of us, ISAF countries, except when I say United States, I'll specify that. So they do sit with us, they contact with us, but they're all calibrating every policy on the day that we were drawing. So again, here we are talking on two different channels. If you would, we are playing from two different sheets of music. That's why the music sounds so horrible, and that's why the recipient, which is the Afghan, both the government side and the people are confused. Confusion in that part of the world creates conspiracy. Okay, now briefly, Pakistan. I'll start with Pakistan. I will leave, as I say, China and the Central Asian states for Q&A because I will not have time for that. I'll stop at Russia. Post 9-11, where are you if you're a Pakistani? First of all, you are forced to abandon your allies, the Taliban. Let us not forget, until September the 12th, 2001, the Pakistanis supported the Taliban fully. It was only a choice for them to either go against the Taliban or be part of the problem that they shifted. That's one. They were also forced to accept the strategic partnership and what we used to call global war on terror, or OCO, or whatever we call it now, is it? It was a forced partnership, not a partnership they liked. It's important to note these issues. What has happened since 9-11, or since the collapse of Taliban, let's put it that way. Since 2001, when the Taliban collapsed, December 5th, if you would, when his Mullah Omar apparently took a motorcycle and crossed the border. What has happened? We, the United States, and our partners are aiding a potential enemy in Kabul. 
We had a hint about the Dillon line and issues of Pakistan. Pakistan and Afghanistan have never recognized each other as states. From 1947, when Pakistan was created, the Afghans took the first shot, and up to today, they both look at each other as a playground for the other. The Afghans literally claim half of Pakistan. What is today called the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa used to be called the Northwest Frontier Province, plus Fatah, federally administrated tribal areas, plus Baluchistan. This is part of the Afghan narrative, it's in the Afghan history, it's in the Afghan storybooks. A project that we lead in our, our center, where we're looking at textbooks in Afghanistan. Right now, history textbooks from fifth grade to ninth grade. Every each one of them talks about this as part of Afghanistan. If you teach your children that that's your country, that's in your mind. Pakistanis look at Afghanistan as a place to counter India, always. It's not in this relationship for Pakistan to see Afghanistan as a nationalistic country, which is building its own army, and India's back is absolutely against the strategic values and strategic thinking. Therefore, go back to my first question, Pakistan does not want Afghanistan to be stable. Period. That's why the Taliban are still there. Yes, they are fine. You know, it's a very interesting relationship. On one hand, they support us. On one hand, they do not. It is, in a Greek sense of word, a dilemma. Two choices, one, none of which are good. Pakistan had a way from 1978 to 2001 to create that strategic depth. Now they lost it. So now what they're trying to create is they're trying to create another depth using people like Haqqani Network, which we just heard are not part of the terrorist organizations. They are being created to go and become governments, Pakistan's government in the box in the region, which we call, uh, you know, for us in the ISAF map, it's called uh, the region east, now west and southwest. And another thing that is very important, if you want to understand why this, what we call Islamism, radical Islam, whatever you name it, is happening in the border areas. They are being used as part to counter nationalism in Afghanistan, S specifically Pashtun nationalism. The idea is that Pakistan, as home to Muslims, has a prerogative over Islam, and to counter Pashtunism, you radicalize them into an Islam Islamic idea. Therefore, they become, sub they become controlled from the other side of the border. Also, the issue of borders goes away. This whole issue of Islam has no borders. This is not about United States or Europe. It's about all the problems therein. As Billy Joe said, we didn't start the fire. But that fire is burning us. Whether we started it or not, it doesn't matter. And sometimes not understanding that puts us into that position. Why are they doing all this? There is a reason. There is a rationale. This is not all craziness. Oh, you know, let's go do that. The second thing, for Pakistan, they also need Islamist ideology to inject into Kashmir. What is going on inside Pakistan today? Al-Qaeda and Taliban. There is a, especially since 2005, but 2008 especially, a realization in most circles of Pakistan that the insurgency is threatening Pakistan itself. Especially what happened in Swat, and especially when Army posts were attacked, mosques were attacked, where army children go. They, they understand that. And there's a differentiation between Al-Qaeda and Taliban. By Al-Qaeda, I mean anybody who's not local, Pashtun or Punjabi. They are going against Al-Qaeda. But they're still not abandoning the Taliban because the fear of a strong Afghanistan in cahoots with India is more the attacks inside the country. Also, they blame our policies, United States policies, mainly for the Taliban in Pakistan. Iran. Pakistan, you know, we can discuss Pakistan at length. First of all, I always have said about Iran that if you look at Afghanistan as a roulette table, Iran has a chip on every single number. They just cannot lose. They even have it on double zero. They just cannot lose. They are not using all their chips, and they are not even rolling the ball. But if the time comes in, they will do it, and they have a lot of assets. Sometimes you hear about Iranians sending weapons to the Taliban. Do they send it? Yes. They usually send it to be caught anyway as a way to show us that they can 
affect us if need be. Part, uh, first of all, Afghanistan is part of Iran's greatness. Whenever you see an Iranian from Mr. Ahmadinejad to anybody is talking about this greatness, Iran cannot even think about greatness if Afghanistan is not in the sphere of influence of Iran. Those of you who know Iranian history or the Iranian narrative, uh, the Shah Nama for Ferdowsi, all those heroes, if you look at them, they were all born in what is today Afghanistan, not in what is today Iran. So you, you have to have an Afghanistan that at least is attached ideologically with you. The second thing is Iran has double policy in Afghanistan. There's a policy from the foreign ministry side that actually looks at Afghanistan as an ally and helps. There's also a policy from the IRGC, the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps, that uses Afghanistan. So it's happening at the same time. Again, a dilemma here. Why, what are Iranians' main goal? In my view, my personal view, first to use, and this is the most important one in the immediate, to use Afghanistan as a bargaining chip on the, the nuclear issue. In case something happens to pressure Iran even more on the nuclear issue, Afghanistan will be turned into something that would look Iraq, would make look Iraq like Disneyland. And they have threatened that. They have more assets, they can create havoc, not only for us, but right across the border are the Italians and the Spaniards, right across the border from Iran. It's going to be pretty nasty. So that's one thing. Two is water, something most people do not talk about. It has nothing to do with war or Islam or anything like that. There are three main rivers that come from Afghanistan into Iran. Eastern Iran is the poorest part of the country, the driest part of the country, and lastly, it is where the Sunni insurgents are, if there are any. Well, there are some, Jundullah especially, in, in, in Baluchistan. Sistan, Baluchistan, there are three rivers, Hari Road, Farah Road, and Hirman. Afghanistan, with our help, collective help, is building four dams on those. If those dams are operational, Iran will not have water, period. Iran is now getting free water. So if this simmers, water comes for free. Also, they want to limit Pakistan's role and, by extension, Saudi Arabia's role. Narcotics, while they're against it, they also use the same narcotic routes to send weapons back in. And lastly, again, going back to the first speech I read you, any success in Afghanistan means that Western system works. Iran does not want that. Therefore, Iran wants Afghanistan to boil. I'll go briefly to India, and then I'll stop in Russia. India's Afghan policies are all Pakistan-centric, number one. Main concerns, they have, India's actually argued with us that, you know, they have the same concerns we have, and why are we supporting Pakistan? Extremism, Islamism, militancy. These are the three things they go against. Geopolitically, Pakistan, Iran, I mean, India does not want a Pakistani-sponsored, Taliban-sided government in Afghanistan. They rather, and also, the, and by extension, they do not want China to gain a bigger foothold in Afghanistan. Because they see, Pakistan, for Indian view, Pakistan, China has two strategic allies, Pakistan and DPRK, North Korea, that's it. And China is seen, I mean, Pakistan is seen as the more valuable one, whereas DPRK is more a burden than anything else. Right now, India is helping a lot. The cornerstone of Indian involvement in Afghanistan, number one, is economic. They have already put $1.2 billion. May not sound a lot in, in our country, but in India, that's a lot of money in Afghanistan. They also are doing something that scares the Pakistanis. The Pakistanis call it the pincer, which basically covers pa Pakistan from two sides, India on this side, Afghanistan pro, pro India, Afghanistan keeps Pakistan at bay. For the Indians, they rather have the war, the proxy war in Afghan soil rather than in Kashmir or in Mumbai. Therefore, I told you initially that most countries involved have other views. Pa Indian embassy has been hit twice. They have lost uh, a ge two gen brigadier generals and a deputy ambassador. It was keep on will happening. But they rather have the war there than in their own country. They're also trying to circumvent Pakistan through this highway that's being built by the Indian Army, basically, to go from Iran, from Chabahar, comes out from Nimroz, if you know the Afghan map in the corner, and then goes to, so it goes around Pakistan. Okay, 
they like to, lastly, they are using some involvement in Baluchistan. Not as much as Pakistan says, but they are involved to keep Pakistan and the Baluchi side busy. Lastly, Russian Federation. If you look at it in the, in the current administration, maybe Afghanistan and the, the missile defense were the two of the main restart buttons, if you would, between the relationship between us and Moscow. The fact that we decided not to put the uh, missile defense in my country of birth, by the way, which is what used to be Czechoslovakia, uh, and, and Czech Republic or Poland, and then secondly, the Afghan thing. So there is some assistance between us. That's a good point. However, Russia is still watching the Afghan situation from sidelines. Russia, in my view, does not want the West to lose nor to win. The situation as is is perfect. And you may ask why. First of all, it is sapping our power. Any sapping of United States power is seen positively, especially by the generals in, in Russia. The second thing, it justifies their stay in Central Asia. Without an Afghan threat, Russia could not justify all these new basings in traditionally part of what was part of Soviet Union and what we call in Washington the Stans, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. And two other issues that are very important. One has to do with hydrocarbons. Again, when Soviet Union collapsed, the West in, in general, and even the Arab countries, we had 19 major pipelines carrying both natural gas and oil from this going through or coming from the territory of the former Soviet Union, 19 projects. Of those 19, only one has seen some realization in the past 20 years or so. And that is Baku Chehan, which is even that one has a problem because it goes through a country called Georgia. And we see when Russians want to cut Georgia, they show us how they can do it. And of course, now creation of this new South Ossetia. Look, look at where that pipeline goes and where South Ossetia is. You know why, why this is very important. Of all the other pipelines have been stopped, allowing Russia to have a monopoly, virtual monopoly, of all the oil and gas that goes to Europe. Countries such as Germany imports close to 80% of their entire oil and gas from pipelines that come through Russia. France has been very, very lucky and very forward thinking for nuclear power. Britain has North Sea, but the rest of Europe, again, Central Europe, Czech Republic, Poland, even Ukraine, they are bound by Russia. It gives Russia a power that is immense. Eventually, it also gives Russia power over China and India. There are two key countries to break that deadlock. One is Russia, sorry, one is Iran. The best country is Iran, but access to both Caucasus, the Caspian, and Central Asia. But Iran already is good for Russia. That's why Russia wants Iran to be exactly the way it is, just a prior state. Second is Afghanistan. We have been trying to put the pipeline through Afghanistan since the Taliban time. If Afghanistan is stable, that pipeline, which is called TAPI, stands for Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, will realize itself. Russia will never want that. So that, again, goes back to simmering. And lastly, I personally view, as I said, as, as a Cold Warrior, there are a lot of Charlie Wilsonovs in Russia. They just like to see some American bodies come back home. This is the payback for what was happening in Afghanistan. I think I'm out of time right now. As I said, I have some thoughts on Central Asia and also uh, China, but we can discuss that if you have time in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Tarzi, and uh, I'm grateful to all of the uh, panelists. I, I, one of the good things about having panelists who've had something to do with the military is that they're all very much on time. Uh, so we have, uh, we have uh, uh, plenty of time for discussion and Q&A. Yes? Go ahead, you first. Um, hmm. It's 
a very long border, so it depends where. Uh, but um, if I understand your, your question correctly, uh, you think that uh, the, the, the coalition forces could offer something to the villages on the border or the Afghan National Army? The Afghan National Army. The Afghan National Army. Well, actually, it's, the, the situation is a little bit different. In uh, most of the places, the Afghan National Army cannot go there. It's too dangerous. It's, it's impossible to, to, to keep their ground. You know, all, the, all that is north of Jalalabad, it's, uh, it's uh, forbidden territory. It's too dangerous, basically. So there is two solutions, where you, you have relatively large outposts and you're going to, to have a few rockets uh, falling on the base uh, every morning, basically, but you can, you can keep your base. But if you want to go uh, closer to the villages, you just cannot, cannot be there because it's too dangerous. So the question is more which part do you keep and which part do you evacuate? And right now, it's uh, evacuation of, uh, I would say, 80% uh, of the border is totally open. And the Afghan National Army is not going to go back there, which actually the right, the right question, your question is interesting because it means that even the end game that we are aiming at now means the Afghan National Army, uh, the, the transition to the Afghan National Army doesn't give us the security of the Afghan border. It means already you have Lashkar et Taiba guys or even Al Qaeda coming back to the region where we have evacuated or where we are not present. So the question, that's why the current strategy, even if everything goes perfectly well, means that Al Qaeda and Lashkar et Taiba, this group can come back to Afghanistan, at least on the border. Uh, if I may, I. I the two, two issues that we need to look at. By the way, I wrote my dissertation. It's called The Judicial State. And I think it's going to be published anytime soon. It's about Afghan judicial state system. I wrote it way before all this happened. The main question in Afghanistan, in my view, if you want a state loosely governed, loosely centralized, whatever, it has to, the concept is not security, but rather justice. Justice comes first. And the notion of justice that somebody could at least keep justice and you know, enforce it when need be, give it legitimacy. So I think in the case here for Afghanistan, my personal ar argument would be more for police rather than army. A smaller army, a larger police force, and a larger border police force. So what the army could bring, and, under the, and I agree right now the situation looks more pessimistic than optimistic, but if you would look at it in a, in, a, in a better scenario, let us say we go back to 2001 and Bonn and, and redraw it, it will be some force that, in case of need, would implement justice. So in the border areas, too, if somebody comes to the government, not the government to, goes to them, because the African ju justice system in the old days, how it worked was well, they were a three-tier justice system. You had local justice, informally you want to call it tribal law, customary law, whatever you want. That operated, but there was a way, if you would, in our system, maybe an appeals court, which would go to two other courts, either a, basically a law that was based on the French law, and by the way, the African constitution was written by a Frenchman, Monsieur Fougere, and who also wrote the Moroccan constitution, by, just as a sidetrack. And so it was French, basically, and Napoleonic law, and the second one was Sharia, of course. So here you go to the customary law, and then come back to either one of these two. There you need enforcement. So this army, but I, like, I rather have it as a police, will be the enforcer of that. It is not to secure the border. I don't think the border security, first you have to understand where the border is. Africans don't recognize that border, regardless of whatever. Uh, it, but but it, is, it is to present an option for those who want to use it to come and get not so much security, because security is more local, but to get justice if need be, because if the, if the, you know, if the local level problem solving fails, right now what happens is there's either a war, whoever has the bigger gun wins, or there's no justice. But here you have somewhere to go back to. And that, I think, we collectively failed right off the bat and bond. Thank you. I, just, just to, when you say, I totally agree with what you said, and the problem is that the Taliban have the judges in yeah. Afghanistan. Now they, 
They, what is they, that? What reason they are so yeah. successful? They, they put the judges in place in a lot of areas, including the border areas. Yeah. Colonel Kelly, do you want to? Just a, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of points on that. Is, is your mic on? Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. The um, there's the one issue of there, there are some places where do they want anything from the uniform security? Stay out. We have our own. You know, that's our justification for why we pulled out of patches that we're not wanted. Um, some other things to keep in mind is sort of the the push model and what we've how we've selected to develop the Afghan National Security Forces. And back in the early days, we focused a lot on the ANA. Uh, then we started to think, on well, the ANA. I'm sorry, the Afghan National Army, Army. The, the regular Army. Then realized, well, for population-centric you know, counterinsurgency, we need to focus more on the police. So we started to work more on the police. The Afghan border police have always been way down in the list of forces that we really look to engage and support. And now kind of the new flavor of the month is just bypass all of that and look at the village uh, security operations, the Afghan local police, all these other things. So as we flow through our assistance and our programming, that one particular component that would do border security is always kind of um, the orphan for, for assistance. You know, another issue to, you know, it's a border, so it's, it takes two to tango. And what are the Pakistanis looking at the other side? Uh, over the last year, until WikiLeaks and this Raymond Davis thing hit, um, our bilateral U.S.-Pakistan cooperation on the border has improved. Um, but it's just bilateral. The Afghans kind of come and sit at the meetings, but they're not key players in that coordination that goes on. And the Pakistanis have frequently expressed their reservation that the Afghan border police as an institution will not be a, um, a credible partner going forward in the future. And for this, by the same token, the, the PACs are looking at the same thing for their local security. You know, the Pakistan military can't stay deployed through the FADA like they are now. Uh, the frontier scouts, to a lesser degree, are in the same constraints. So they are debating with you know, Lashkars, Levies, Kassadars, are very similar to the Afghan local police or village stability things that we're doing. Uh, but the Pakistanis have the same reservations we reflected that, wow, this might have some utility, but is this, in fact, just creating new militias and warlords that are going to be a problem later on? So they're, they're having the same debate that we are about these things. Yes? Or fuel the war in general, and in, in terms of how, how does it fund the Taliban, and how much of a role does it play with security in Afghanistan? Well, I'll just I'll take a actually I talked to a, another course about this yesterday. That um, in purely mea culpa from from the DoD perspective, it's something we don't really want to deal with. Um, there's actually some issues of, for example, there is a, an entire section of funding and programmatics for counter narco terrorism. When we DoD hear that, we hear counterterrorism. That sounds good. We can go and spend that money and do things we want to do. Um, a perfect example would be the Torkham border crossing. We had a, a significant amount of development to improve that, and we used CNT money. Um, a senator subsequently came and said, well, this is very impressive. How much narcotics have you guys intercepted? And the soldiers <laughs> on the ground, well, we're not doing that, sir. Um, so the senator is a little upset. So that's sort of like a practitioner's <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, as with most things, I think when you look at Afghanistan, again, with that first thesis, I said that nobody went to Afghanistan because of the country. We went there because of 9-11. Sim simple as that. Uh, you know, the State Department at the time had actually closed the Afghan desk. Uh, to tell you how much it was far away from our minds, we have something in the military. Uh, it's run by the Army, but it's, we all use it. It's called the DLI, Defense Language Institute, in Monterey. They stopped teaching Pashto. In 1992, stopped it. Uh, so we we thought, you know, that's over. That's it. We went there because of that. So going back to that, when bond happened, division of labor, the British for pricked count on narcotics, but it was always an afterthought. And it has been Afghanistan has been more a lab rather than a strategy for everybody, NGOs, UN, our countries involved, militaries. In surf strategy, we have had tactical issues or, OK, this will work. As you just heard, OK, Afghan National Law, we know that's not good. We have had more militia names that I actually have a list of different militias we tried to create. Because one person came in and said, no, you know what? Afghans don't never had a central government. Of course, there is no central government. Then, oh, OK, well, let's go for that. Counter narcotics went the same way. It was always ad hoc rather than something with a strategy. And initially, we have all collectively have done robust counter narcotics with interdiction. We have had, partially, we have had nothing. Some countries involved literally on their caveats say that look, look the other way around. 
I have a picture of one allied country where they had, I don't think they had ever seen uh, him that big because they have a car and I actually have that picture. They have a, I don't know, you may have it too. It's a, it's a military vehicle and it's camouflaged with huge leaves of, of Afghan hashish. I'm sure Nazar, some, some people may want to. Uh, I won't say no. that part. <laughs> uh, but see, it, they just look the other way around. So the issue of, uh, and, and unfortunately the Afghan government is directly involved in it. So it's a hot potato nobody wants to touch. People in Congress estimate numbers. If you want a real number of how much of that money comes to the Taliban, you will never find it. Uh, my view is, unless you tackle it and make it illegal, this whole culture of criminality that is pervasive in every part of Afghan society will never end. Afghanistan never had this much money coming into it. You go to Kabul, again, as I said, in my view, the whole society is based on justice. You go to Kabul, you have people who have absolutely nothing to eat, and then you have people r driving in shiny, uh, actually, one had a mirror color, you could see yourself, uh, Humvees, and houses that are just incredible. They're gaudy, but they're all with mirrors, and that shows injustice, and guess what, who they blame? Us. You are there, you are promoting this. Where does that money come from? That is drug money. So it is a very important point, and right now, by not looking at it, I think we are trying to push a problem under the rug, hoping that sometime it clears itself at one. Maybe, yeah, to, to, to complete this point, uh, I think that it's just not realistic right now to do something about it, because our resources are, are, are basically declining very quickly. Sure. If it were just about uh, Elmand, uh, Kandahar, maybe we could do something, but I, I tend to, to think that the DOD is right on this one. It's too complicated. But there are plenty of other places, uh, all the north, uh, or the, the east around Jalalabad, which is traditionally a place where you, you, you have a lot of opium. And all, in all these places, it's just not technically uh, not possible to, to, to eradicate uh, the cultivation of opium. I don't even speak about cashish, because cashish is not, well, it's a lot of money, huh, but, uh, well, uh, it's just not possible. And what we are going to see, uh, we are going to withdraw, so you will have less and less places where you have any kind of control, and so the opium and the hashish is going to be more, more and more important in the next few years. But there is one good province to look at as a, as a sign of hope, uh, although it's not as hopeful this year as it was last. Nangarhar uh, went from the second largest producer of, of opium to virtually zero, and it, most of it was not direct introduction. Was that, was that because they went to wheat? They went to uh, four different crops. Yeah, yeah that's, that's an interesting place because first it cost uh, the governor of Jalalabad uh, a lot politically, basically lost the support of a few districts. That's why the situation, the security situation around Jalalabad is, became much worse the last 18 months. And second, the, the opium is back. Actually. It's back now, this year. Uh, Horiani district and so on. It's shoo, shoo. So, so basically we cannot do much. Yeah. I should um, say that um, you know there were serious attempts at uh, poppy crop eradication back in 2005, uh, which uh, backfired big time. I, I think everybody agrees that that was a big mistake, because what you were really doing was depriving farmers of their income that year. Uh, Barney Rubin estimated that one in seven of the farmers whose crops were burned had to sell a child, typically a girl. Uh, so um, that didn't make us any friends. Uh, and, and of course, it didn't actually succeed in eradicating uh, the, the, the uh, poppy cultivation. Uh, and uh, so I interdiction uh, of the uh, of the po of the of the uh, heroin is is probably more important uh, or a better way to go, but um, I've given this some thought, uh, you know, sort of um, comparatively, and I note that Turkey used to have a big problem with poppies back if you go back in Lexus in the 70s and 80s uh, in Anatolia. And that as the Turkish state uh, got its act together, as the Turkish economy improved, as state capacity improved, you don't hear anything about that problem anymore. 
And it seems to me the likely that you're, we were putting the cart before the horse to worry so much about it. That is to say, if you could, could actually endow the Afghan state with greater capacity, uh, if you could get the Afghan economy jumping, because last I knew the, in nominal terms, the Afghan uh, gross national product is $12 billion a year, of which something like three or four billion is, is poppies, right? So um, if the Afghan, I mean, that's tiny as a gross domestic product, you know, $12 billion a year for a, for a country of some 34 million. Uh, if you had a proper economy there, the poppies would recede in importance. When the Taliban were in charge in Afghanistan, how was the poppy? Mm -hmm. Was it flourishing then? No, uh, well, they, uh, they destroyed the book. They destroyed it. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, so I was there. there then, right? Sorry? You were there then? Uh, not all the time, but yes. Yeah. So was it, yeah. <laughs> and I did not check personally, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the idea, I was extremely skeptical because the, the, they put a mullah in charge. I mean, everybody was a mullah. Uh, but uh, I mean, they put a mullah in charge of the counter, uh, I mean, counter narcotics, yeah. And the guy was not very. I mean, not very impressive. But at the same time, uh, he was extremely honest. So uh, in Kabul, you had, uh, I mean, real honest people. And the deal was the Taliban were thinking, OK, the Westerners are interested in three things, women, Al-Qaeda, and drugs. Ah. And uh, for Al-Qaeda, it's a bit complicated because bin Laden is a good friend. Uh, women, it's out of, I mean, it's not on the table. So if we want international recognition, there is one thing we can do is drugs. And so they did it. Uh, and they paid a political price because in 2001, uh, especially in the East, the, a lot of tribes, I mean, went against the Taliban, not for ideological reason, but because they wanted to, to, to get back to opium. And even before the end of the fight, actually, people were planting opium again in, uh, in the East. So yes, yeah, it's doable. You, have, you need a state. It's doable, and you have to pay a political price. What's holding Pakistan from giving away the uh, Al Qaeda leadership that's uh, hiding in somewhere in northern Pakistan? I mean, it's it sounds ludicrous for a state not to know where those people are. I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, everybody is, uh, uh, but. My take is that just you, you travel in these areas, which was possible a few years ago. You have a series of uh, kala, means very large houses, a little fortress, would say, yeah, yeah. fortresses. And uh, you cannot enter these places, basically. The police cannot enter, the army cannot, or, or you have to kill uh, all the men, which is a little bit complicated. Then uh, you have a social uh, structure that is uh, very, very particular. And we have the terrain, which is perfect. So all together, and uh, not much informants, and all together, I really think that the central government, the Pakistan government, doesn't know where he's been. And that's my, my but at the same time, I'm sure that they know very well where is Mullah Uma. Yeah. So it's totally it's, different. I, I agree with that. I, I, I think if they knew, this is my hunch, where the main leadership of Al-Qaeda was, that is a they would have let it go. How they can find it is right. I mean, first of all, you have these mazes. If he doesn't communicate by any electronic sources or goes out, the fact that you know some of these people have been captured is either they have been stupid to use electronics. The minute they touch a cell phone, that's it. Uh, or, by the way, this, they, have, they have gone out. If they go into a place like Bajawar, or Karachi for that matter, I mean, look at, you know, you say how can a state cannot find it. Let me give you a good example. We had this crazy nut from, uh, where was he, in Montana, Unibomber. How long did he evade our whole system? Yes. And you can, and this is much more. The country where there are social networks that keep, you have two options. One, you can go to these, these forts and disappear literally or in holes. Or the second way is you go to a city like Karachi, which is now nobody even knows how many people, between 12 to 20 million people. And once you're in that maze, it's over. You can disappear. I don't think, I, I personally don't think they're protecting him. And I agree with him. There's a difference between Al-Qaeda and Taliban. Uh, so that's, 
Yeah. I, I, I For one thing, Asif al Zardari is known to be extremely greedy, and $25 million would be <laughs> very welcome in his bank account. <laughs> they used to ask George W. Bush why is it he hadn't found bin Laden. Bush would say, he's hiding. <laughs> priority for each um, group of armed militia or armed police or uh, armed people one way or the other as we keep changing our mind that it needs to be militias or it needs to be police forces or it needs to be border guards, etc. What happens to the people that you were training as militia? What happens to the people that were training as police? It seems to me you're just setting up a one very, very big mess with a lot of well, you, you are hitting a very important question. I, I always say, I even have created an English word. You cannot empower somebody and then disempower them. I know there's no English word of disempowerment, but you can, you can give me that word. Uh, throughout the, as I said, you know, I, I was quoting Yogi Berra. Uh, I know he's not, you know, in Detroit, Yankees are not good, but he said it. It's deja vu all over again. We, we collectively are the same people that now we, some of them are create rulers of Afghanistan, some of them we're fighting today, in order to, at the time, kill Soviets. The idea was basically to just bleed the Soviet Union. As, as uh, uh, Charlie Wilson would say, I would not be satisfied until I see 60,000 funerals in Leningrad. The idea was to kill Soviets in that. And there was a whole different idea that Afghans, by and large, are not attached so much to the central government, if the central government becomes even communist and doesn't affect them in their houses, so what? So radicalize them. Thus, the people like Ms. Bin Laden and crazies like that coming in there and radicalizing to, as so-called Brzezinski doctrine, the former national security advisor of, of it actually started with President Carter, believe it or not. Uh, it was just that people in the, during the Reagan administration that just took off from there to hurt the Soviet Union in soft belly. That was the ideology. And guess what? When we left, we left because of two major issues. Number one, the Soviet Union collapsed. We didn't think that. We thought it would be just bleeding. Well, they collapsed. The second thing was, of course, Saddam Hussein decided to have a 19 province. So two new things happened. A new world with Soviet Union collapsing, Central, Central Europe opening, and then secondly, we are being invited for the first time to go defend the country and an area which is very important to us. With those two cases, we left Afghanistan. I remember I wrote something way back in there called Afghanistan, the Cold War junkyard. It was a junkyard of the Cold War, so these people are there. The same question today, Afghan officials say too, when you arm these people, you have already empowered them. You can tomorrow, and as you just heard, the DDR, the disarmament, the demobilization, and reintegration is not working. So you have created these cells of power, and it's very hard to give them incentive to give those arms back. So you're creating more and more of these people for short term. Again, in Afghanistan, as I said, ad hoc has always been short term gain at the expense sometimes of long term strategic uh, gain because it's never been important. Goes back to that question. The country has not been the focus. It's been something outside of it. Okay, just want to point on there too to, to distinguish in your initial question about is we is sort of the flavor of the month changes between different groups. The VSO, ALP, that kind of all those informal militias. That's that's one topic which leads to the kind of issues you're talking about. The other one is the the changes in policy and approach to the, the formal military forces, the uniformed forces, which are not quite so concerned of turning yeah. into crazies. Yeah. But it is a problem for as we change resources, and the, the U.S. government isn't all that agile to move around. This is what we're going to focus on. This is what we're going to focus on. And it also adds to the point I was trying to make about metrics. I mean, I was getting a little philosophical about what does a metric mean. But there's the, the, the functional thing of almost every year we change what the metrics are because now we're looking at this, or now we're looking at that. Well, the whole point of a metric is to watch it change over time. So if you're looking at a new metric every time, you, you can't tell what the trend is really. And that's the other issue. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, and just to, uh, you know the PRT is this provincial reconstruction team. Actually, I, I tried to check if we had studies showing that it's working or not, and if there were some metrics. I never found uh, reasonably, I, I, I found one article about how the PRT working. Uh, what's the impact on the, on the province? 
there is no study. So all the metrics are changing all the time, or on the key points, you don't find any metrics. But to, to come back to your question, first there is the historical depth in a way. Uh, when you were speaking about spinball deck, uh, actually uh, it was the Soviet used a militia in the same place with the same tribe, and the, the current chief is the son of the, <laughs> of the. You know, I mean, for the people, it's. I mean, it's it's the same guys actually. The father was working for the Soviets. The son is working for the Americans. It's the same tribal uh, tribal group. Huh? So uh, more or less tribal group because the Norsei are kind of uh, kind of messy. If, I, if nobody is Norsei, you know. So. <laughs> the second thing is that we know how to disarm in theory. Uh, but you have to be neutral to come from the outside and to do it quick and to do an amnesty at the same time. Exactly what we, uh, that's what the Taliban did in 94, 95, 96 in the south. You arrive from the outside, you say, okay, I'm neutral, I don't want to know who killed who in the, next ten, in the last 10 years, and I'm taking on the arms. And people, uh, and people give the arms, actually. That's what happened. Then, the problem is that we have chosen allies everywhere, in tribal groups, in social groups, in Afghanistan. So nobody can disarm, because everybody knows that there is a dominant group allied with the United States. This group is not going to disarm, because if they disarm, the other guys are going to, to get after them. So the problem is that we are never neutral in a situation. If we leave Kandahar, our allies, the Zirak tribes, basically, are going to pay the price. It's a very huge price in this area. So that's where we, are, we cannot disarm the, the place, basically. This is a question for anyone on the panel, because I feel you all sort of alluded to it without answering it explicitly. But Dr. Tarzi, I really enjoyed your list of countries who are benefiting from instability in Afghanistan. But of course, you, you ignored the government that's benefiting the most from instability in Afghanistan, which is Hamid Karzai's government. Um, so in your opinions for any of the speakers, is it possible to have a stable Afghanistan with Hamid Karzai in Kabul, Ahmed Wali Karzai in Kandahar, and cronies <laughs> spread through the ministries? <laughs> so my favorite topic. Uh, so uh, quickly, no. The answer is no. Yes. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, just one word. It's it's a uh, it's a two layer problem. First, uh, Kaza is not going to reform anything because he cannot. Since 2005, we are in a process of deconstructing the Afghan state. There was a kind of Afghan state, maybe 2005, 6. We are, yeah. but now it's this, slowly we are decon it's deconstructed. You know, so we have less and less state concretely. The state is is controlling now what one third of the population max. Uh, in places where you don't have Taliban, you don't you don't have a state anymore. It's just local local people. And Karzai doesn't doesn't have the perception of that. People around him are, are very very dubious people, and uh, not the fact that they are corrupt, that's not the big deal, that the fact that they, they are not building a center, and they are playing a peripheral interest. So, no, there is no possibility. That's why the transition is, is basically not working. Uh, you have seen the list of the places who are going to transition. It's a joke, you know, the Panjshir, okay, you can't transition the Panjshir because <laughs> first there is no, I mean, all the Panjshirs are against the Taliban, so it's easy, but the real stuff is not happening. The second thing, the second layer of the problem is that these guys are not going to fight. They have too much money. Huh? Uh, all the political elites in Kabul, uh, these guys, maybe they fought against the threat that they were young at that time, now they are, they are a little bit older. They have their money in Dubai or for Rashid Dostum, probably much more in Turkey or Uzbekistan. His horses, at least, are in Uzbekistan. Uh, and these guys are not going to fight the Taliban. If we leave these guys, they are not motivated. They have no ideological uh, ideas. I mean, it's they, just, they are here to make money. So first, no, they are not going to reform. Second, they are not going to fight. No, no comment? Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, one good point on your, on your last point about the, the power players who are there. A, a counter threat finance analyst was talking to us and said he was looking at the banking issues and said, everybody has an exit plan for Afghanistan but us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, th there's been this big bank scandal of De Kabul Bank, which uh, um, seems to have uh, involved Karzai's, one of Karzai's brothers and his, one of his major campaign financers, and money from the bank was used to bankroll his campaign in 2009. Uh, which was widely viewed by the international community as highly corrupt. Uh, and uh, then um, turns out that money was being diverted from the bank to buy real estate in Dubai. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the real estate in Dubai around 2008, <laughs> late in that year, became worthless. And uh, typically, your value of your property is your collateral. So then the loans got, you know, should have been called in. And to the extent they weren't, what it did was undermine the, the stability of the bank. So I, I think it went bankrupt. Uh, and um, it, it seems fairly clear that the US taxpayer will have to pay for that. Bank. Uh, although the Afghan government and the U.S. government have both denied that this is the case, um, I personally can't figure out where else the money would come from to float the bank again. And letting it fail since one of three major banks in Kabul is probably not an option. And I, I can just say something about the issue of individual versus institution. Before I even joined the government, I wrote a piece which is published that I can refer to you that if you want it, I'll let you know. So you can see a little bit more uh, issue of that. Afghanistan from day one, and maybe some other places too, but mainly in Afghanistan I can see that. And this is not a US issue. It was again this collective in Bonn. Uh, I was uh, fortunate, uh, fortunate to be kind of a little bit involved in that. Uh, it was all about, again, doing something fast, the four and a half page document turning Afghanistan from what we described, Stone Age, to something looking like Norway. Uh, and it was based on one individual. The entire constitution of Afghanistan is written upon a person rather than a system. So when you bring a person rather than an institution, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And I'm not saying the person is good or bad, but the person was not as good as we thought it was. Putting them in a pedestal from the best dressed man in the world to giving them any medal from any country in Europe, and then to suddenly dismissing him. So he's also confused. And by the way, as you know, yesterday one of his uh, cousins was, uh, or uncle was killed. Uh, Haji or Muhammad Karzai was killed actually two days ago in Kars, which is a small village north of Afghanistan. Uh, sorry, north of Kandahar city. Uh, so you, you, in a way, that it's, it's not just the, the problem they're in, it's a problem in the whole system, which is individual-based rather than institution-based. And unless you build on something on an institution, things go wrong. And, and we've seen it right now in the Middle East, what's going on. Wherever the institutions are stronger, things are going the correct way. Where there's about an individual, look at Libya. Yes. presentation Phil was you know, on a sort of pessimistic note, but I'm, I want to ask it anyway, uh, because that's why I came here today. I, as a concerned citizen, uh, not as a scholar or a teacher, um, I'm just wondering, you know, what uh, can we who are sitting here in Ann Arbor or in America, um, you know, would you say there are good civil society groups that are worth supporting, that are worth giving money to? I mean, it seems in a situation in which, you know, President Obama doesn't even have a handle on what's, what's going on, and there really are no good answers. You know, what do we as citizens um, have to offer? Have there been moments in the past 10 years when people, you know, you would say there, you know, there's been some form of effective mobilization or advocacy or positive efforts? Um, because, you know, honestly, uh, since it is our tax dollars which is funding this, you know, I feel we have a responsibility. I can tell you as a citizen, as somebody who used to wear the Marine uniform, uh, first of all, we should know more about it. I am appalled at the fact that we are in a war. This is the longest war the United States has fought ever, ever. And there's so much, li I mean, the fact that you are all here, you're doing something way ahead of the rest of us. And, and unless, you know, so first of all, there's awareness. 
what is going on. Before we even take an action, we have to be aware that there is a war going on. Because it is not a Vietnam, it, because it's not, thankfully, the casualties are still, to me, one American dead is too much in a place where we can do it without, uh, well, I, I'll stop with that. Uh, but, so we first have to be aware about it. And then action could come from there. Awareness is the most important thing. Well, mm, I'm a European citizen, uh, as you have understood already. Um, so the taxpayer, the French uh, and European taxpayer also is giving a lot of money, actually, the second contributor. And uh, first, uh, it has been a disaster. I'm speaking for the European Union so far. So absolutely nothing worked. Uh, the Europol, the, the formation of Afghan police has been terrible, uh, terrible mess. Uh, judges, the Italian was supposed to form judges. It's, it's, it's not even, the, I mean, I don't want to speak about it. Uh, I mean, it's awful. I mean, that's the first thing. I mean, the, the, the level of incompetence on the ground is just, I mean, well, that's the first thing. The second thing is that the experts were very well paid. Thank you. So large part of the money, taxpayer maybe, but large part of the money came back to your country and, and mine, but not to the same person, uh, okay? It's redistribution of, of wealth, you know, a lot. Uh, and and that, that's important, huh? I mean, that's, that's uh, politically important. The second thing is that plenty of things work on the ground. The problem is that it's not stable. Uh, NSP is, I mean, the National Solidarity Program is a good program, it's kind of, of joint uh, venture between NGOs and the Afghan government, it worked not so bad. Uh, there were schools, I mean, there are still a lot of schools, but less and less every year. And there's a problem that this program were a program for uh, education, uh, even if the education, there was this stupid idea that uh, it was only primary and not secondary school, which was a disaster because you need all the level at the same time, but whatever. All these gains are going to be, to be lost because, of course, uh, the security situation is, is, uh, is out of control. And that's the real problem. All the people have done good jobs in some places, uh, and this is going to be lost. And the third thing I would say right now, the priority I see, but maybe priority I see, is to have the, the so-called civil society, I mean, all these people, to work together to be part of what's going to happen next. I, they should not trust us. Uh, in the future, they should take their, 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 they should take the money first, they should organize themselves, because in the future, they will have probably to deal with the Taliban uh, in Kabul, uh, in a government of coalition. There are very strong fundamentalist movement in the Afghan government. So it's time for them to, to work together, which is not the case right now, to work together uh, and to be as far as possible their own voice. That's, yeah. And I would just echo the, the first point about m more engagement. Um, yeah. The fact that we're all fighting this war and having a good time and we'll let you know how it goes. I don't think it's healthy either for the Republic or for us in the military, just sitting and, and we basically live in an echo chamber amongst ourselves. Um, that's specifically why I volunteered to come to something like mm -hmm. this because I don't think there's enough of it going on. Yeah. That's, I, I mean, I, I travel when I'm asked if I have time to go and, and bring it out. It's not, you know, it's nothing else, that's it. I feel it as a, as a citizen that, that we have to do this thing. We have to bring in, and not criticism, debate, thinking that there is a war going on. And it's, as, as Jill just said, I mean, women's right, a great gain. Does it matter? Does it not matter? Is it moral issue? It's not. It's going to go right out the window. I mean, first thing, he's right. Every Afghan government that wants to show his machoism, the easiest thing is just usurp the woman's right. It makes you like, be like a big guy. And is it good or bad? Is it strategically important for us? That's another question. But there's a moral issue. So those are all the issues that to be debated. Uh, and, and that's just the beginning of it. Then we can find out what's more important. So. It's 5% of the information in the United States is, uh, is about Afghanistan, 5%. Longest of war. the news report, you're yeah. saying? In the news report. Longest yeah. war Five ever percent. in the history of oh, the I country. think that's high. But that's I, high. That's, I, I that's run, a little I bit I run long. a blog on Middle Eastern affairs, and uh, occasionally I'll, I'll do an entry on something in Afghanistan. I'll try and read the Persian press online or get some information about something that happened. And uh, I can track uh, through Google Analytics my, my hits. 
And whenever I do Afghanistan, they go down. <laughs> Nobody interested. I might as well print it out, take it in my garden, and bury it. Uh, it's bizarre. I mean, and, and I think before we close, though, I think there was a positive part of this question that didn't get addressed, which was, uh, are there any NGOs uh, that if somebody wanted to send money or encourage them, uh, are, are, I, I know there's a lot of corruption and so forth, but we had Sarah Chase here last uh, uh, September, yeah. uh, who was a former NPR reporter who stayed in Kandahar, has got involved in uh, encouraging local people to make uh, soap. Uh, scented soap yeah. out of Afghan soap. fruit and things. Uh, and uh, it, I only know about it from her, so she thought well of it, but I... I, uh, uh, I cannot... Yes, there are many. They are very brave people. I cannot, for various reasons, give you the name of them. Uh, I, as a government official, I cannot solicit money for somebody else, but I, there are a lot of them. No, you cannot do that. No, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, I'm not going to. Be, I would say uh, to, more general <laughs> that I can, you know, <laughs> uh, is that uh, there, there are a series of criteria you should uh, you should use when uh, when you decide to give money or not. I would say my, my personal criteria would be first, the guys must have been here a long time. Yeah. It, could be an Afghan Afghan or some kind of mixed. I mean, okay, that's the first thing. The second thing, they should have, uh, they should get uh, their money not exclusively from one big, uh, contr uh, one big uh, organization. Typically, I would say somebody working only with USAID would not be on my list uh, uh, for different reasons that I could explain. But uh, let's say that I would prefer somebody who is more with some kind of specific program for a long time, with its own strategy, and working with different uh, uh, with different organization uh, fund uh, to get some fund. Huh? That's this kind of organization. And I would say, tactically, right now, I would not choose uh, people working necessarily in agriculture. I would choose people working uh, in the cities. It could be education, could be whatever who could be a little business, how to help little businesses in Afghanistan. So people working on this kind of thing, so it's easier to control and it's uh, less, uh, you know, and the money disappears uh, less. Uh, what about something like uh, Médecins uh, Sans, Sans Frontières? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are good friends, actually. Uh, <laughs> do, do, Doctors Without Borders, which does a lot of good work around the world, but I, I think they've had a special concentration on Afghanistan. Uh, there is the old uh, Afghan uh, network in, uh, inside MSF, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Well, we've come to uh, 6 p.m., so I think we should close it there. Uh, thank you all for coming out, uh, and thanks so much to our expert panel uh, for enlightening us on this central issue for our republic, as was said.